Well. Well, that was nice of you to applaud my arrival. I appreciate that. <clears throat> my name is Tom Coleman, the president and CEO of Coleman Worldwide. We organize the U.S. Pavilion at, uh, at your 6 o'clock. And we are <clears throat> extremely honored uh, not only to have uh, our Apollo All-Stars with us, but we're also honored to have a relationship with the ULA organization. And I'm really happy to, that uh, Tori Bruno has agreed to, um, to moderate this afternoon's uh, panel. And... Um, with no further ado, let's get this show rolling. Tori, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And thank you all for coming. So, if you don't know who ULA is, we build rockets. I run ULA. I've been building rockets my whole life. And the reason I have been building rockets my whole life is in part because of these gentlemen here on my right. So when I was a little boy, I saw men walk on the moon, and I heard a speech that I will never forget. And I'm sure many of you have heard it, and you know the speech I'm talking about. We got three fighter pilots here, so we've organized some sound effects so you guys would feel at home. <laughs> hey, Tori, you know, yeah. everybody I know was a little boy when I flew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I figured you'd heard that one before. And I can't listen to this without getting tears in my eyes. Without getting tears in your eyes. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. These are brave American men. That speech just didn't inspire me. They inspired these men. They stepped forward and they volunteered to explore the remotest of frontiers the most impenetrable of wildernesses and the farthest shore that any human being has ever trod upon. These are American heroes. These are Apollo astronauts. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> now, they don't require any introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. So we've got, I'm going to start in order of missions. So we've got Apollo 7 pilot, Walt Cunningham, United States Marine combat fighter pilot, hoorah. 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 Always tell a Marine, but not much. <laughs> Thank you. That was just for you. That was just for you. And we got Al Warden, Air Force fighter pilot, Apollo 15 lander pilot. Thank you very much. Recognized in the Guinness World Records for at least briefly being the loneliest man alive. That's what they say. For his time transiting the far side of the moon. That's why we put him in the middle so he wouldn't feel lonely here today. <laughs> and of course, Charlie Duke, also lander pilot, Apollo 16. Youngest man to walk on the moon. All right, so let's get going. I was hoping before we do just the questions that maybe I could ask each of you to take a moment individually and talk about what the Apollo 50th anniversary means to you. Who wants to go first? All right, Walt. Testing, te right. we got to turn it up. You got okay. Being close, Walt. He's already chewed me out once for not speaking <laughs> rightly in this. <clears throat> but I have to tell you, it's the first time I've ever been talking on something like this, and my whole mind is wrapped up in what's going on. But uh, I feel very fortunate in my life to have lived when I did, to have had the opportunity to do the things that I did, and. Uh, as I get older, I miss those things more, and I think it has a little more emotional impact on me. There's probably on the uh, Apollo program, I think there's maybe 13 of us still from that program that are still alive. And I, I thoroughly enjoy my friends that we get to see each other every once in a while on it. And uh, they touch me emotionally almost as much as the acrobatic pilot. 
That's really sweet. Thank you, Walt. All right, Al. Okay. Um, to me, the 50th anniversary is such a unique time in history because I think it gives us an opportunity to think back about what we did 50 years ago, realize where we are today, and where we want to go in the future. And I think it's a great time of reflection. It's a great time of understanding what wonderful things people can do if they put their mind to it and if the whole country's behind it. I only hope that we have that kind of commitment in the country today to go forward. And I think this is a great time for us to dedicate ourselves to going forward and doing something similar to what we did 50 years ago. Because I think it's within us to do that. Uh, but we've just got to make sure we got the resolve to do it. Well said. Uh, to me, the uh, 50th anniversary is uh, very special because I think back about uh, the, the teamwork that took to, to the teamwork it took to get to there and be successful. Um, the astronauts rode on the top of the rocket, but there were a whole team, 400,000 people working. And I had the privilege of uh, seeing uh, not only the contractors, the, uh, the technicians and everybody else, but also seeing it from mission control side and, uh, and being in mission control when uh, Neil and Buzz landed on the moon, and the teamwork that uh, developed between the the mission control team and the crew. Uh, there's a film out called uh, Unsung Heroes of Apollo, uh, Mission Control, the Unsung Heroes of Apollo. And I think that uh, looking back now, the thing that I remember the most was that teamwork that we developed uh, that uh, motivated all of America I was a young fighter pilot in uh, Ramstein, Germany, when uh, Kennedy announced the Apollo program. And, you know, I didn't think, you know, hoo-ha, we had 15 minutes in space uh, at that point with Alan Shepard's flight, and he's committing us to go to the moon. And uh, the most remarkable thing about it was eight years and two months later, we did it from zero, you know, not even knowing how to do it but we did it. What a motivational program for our country. And hopefully we're getting back that uh, with Artemis and we're gonna to go to the moon again. Yes. All right, and it's about time. So you talked about how the team pulled together and did this amazing thing. Now you guys have had incredible careers. I mean, as if being an Apollo astronauts were not enough. Your military careers were exemplary. You've done things after Apollo. I wonder if you would say a little bit about the things you observe about teams that make them truly amazing. Why don't you go first, Al? We could get to the moon, but. Uh, I would say that everything we did from the time we entered the space program until we made a flight, revolved around doing things as a team. And it didn't make any difference what we were doing. If we we're flying, we had instructors. If we were in simulators, we had instructors. We had software guys that uh, taught us the software. Uh, our geology training was with a team of uh, US Geological Survey geologists. Everything we did, we didn't do anything solo we could not have done what we did without the teams that were around us, I believe. And I think even, even during the flight, uh, we relied totally on mission control uh, to make sure that we're okay. Now, you understand the difference between a, an American space program and a Russian space program. An American space program, you fly everything in flight. It's all done by the pilot on board. The Russian program, I don't know how they're doing today, but originally they flew everything from the ground. And so they really had people that were just passengers along like Valentina was a passenger. She was selected for the program because she was a great parachutist, not because she was a pilot. Uh, so it was, 
it, 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 with us, it was teamwork between those who were on the flight and mission control. And I think that, I, I, I think the absolute example of that is Apollo 13. When mission control jumped in once they lost that oxygen tank and they got those guys all straight and in charge, we were all involved in that. Um, and we all did various things. Uh, but it was a total team effort that got Apollo 13 back. So I believe back, I don't, I don't know, I, I've been out of NASA a long time now. I don't know how things go today. But I know when we were in the program and we were getting ready for a flight and making a flight, everything depended on the teamwork. And we trusted and respected everybody that worked with us. And I think that's why we were so successful. That's uh, one of the reasons why in those days it was entirely different than it is today. Hello. Did I finally pass? Okay. Uh, our society and culture has changed a lot in the last 50 years. And back in those days, we could count on everybody, even though we were also very competitive. We were all we were from different, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Marine fighter pilot, and you got Air Force, and you know, we had Navy. And yet, we were all competitive. And part of the reason was, in those days, you were raised to be that way. You know, he was competitive in those days, I guarantee you. Okay? And it, I think it brings a mental attitude to you that really is helpful. Uh, the one thing that bothers me today is I see us slipping away from that, and everything is so automatic, and is, uh, so much equipment is uh, all automatic on it. And I wonder if you ever get a chance to really one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, shoot somebody down or get in on it. And what's happened in our space program, we're turning everybody almost is there is getting there for automatic rides, and th th it's not the same as dependent as it was on individual and performance. And I think that is a good plus for society because it, 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 uh, it's, it's a situation that makes you want to take care of yourself and to come out ahead and to take care of your team and make sure that the team you're on wins. Uh, well, I just want to uh, reiterate uh, what everybody else has said about the team. Uh, we, we visited a lot of contractors uh, while we were in training. And uh, it was motivational tours, but it was also a confidence builder for us uh, to go to these contractors. And I can remember whether it was the battery contractor or the suit contractor or the spacecraft contract, everywhere we went, I said, well, what are you doing? And whether it was an engineer or whether it was a guy sweeping the floor, everybody said, I'm sending a man to the moon. That was their ad attitude. We're sending a man to the moon. So you had a lot of confidence in the team. And I think also everybody had this idea, if this thing fails, it's not going to be my fault. <laughs> and so everybody was focused on their job. We stayed focused on Apollo, no matter what your job was. And that was really uh, heartening for me when I got on board the Saturn that uh, I knew everybody was focused on getting me there and back safely. And uh, we wanted to do our job correctly uh, to bring uh, the, the glory to NASA, if you will, just not to us. We were on the top, but everybody else was pushing us off. That's great, Charlie, and that means a lot to me, too, because as you guys know, very shortly, we're going to return Americans to space from American soil on one of our Atlas rockets, and I think about it every day. I got the crew's picture on my desk, so do all of my team. They've been out to the place. They've been out to the factory. We are acutely aware. You know what, Tori? I'd rather be in a spacecraft flying than be in a year spot worried about the guy in the spacecraft. <laughs> I think it's a much easier job than we had. I agree. All right, so I got to... I, I have to tell you, during launch, and people have asked me a thousand times since, the, the launch, somebody's outside, he's watching, 
and he's apparently scared to death because they asked what were we thinking about and I can tell you this we were only thinking about making sure that anything that you did was going to keep making that possible it, it, I've never seen uh, that, that since really that's the way it is thank you alright we're going to change gears a little bit so amazing as it might sound to those of us in the space community there are people that still question why we do this especially now that we're going back to the moon it's a big effort it's going to take a lot of money it's going to take a lot of people I wonder if you would share a little bit about the benefits of space and why we do this I'll, I'll go first can you hear me okay um, I happen to believe that the most important thing about the space program going, Gem uh, going uh, Mercury, Gemini, through Apollo uh, was not so much putting a man on the moon as it was developing the technology to get there. And I think that was a major, major win for this country back then. Because if you go back in time, let's go back to the late 50s, uh, when the government funded the development of silicon chips. You no know, silicon chips came down through military secret programs, got filtered down into the, into the military, filtered down into NASA. And in NASA, in building all the systems they needed to go to the moon, put that technology out into commercial uh, industry. And it's that technology that made our country so successful for the last 30, 40 years. And it's all based on things like silicon chips that were developed. It was all things like Figuring out how to deal with titanium. How do, you, how do you weld titanium? We didn't know how to do that when we started the program. And there were a myriad of technologies that were developed to make the Apollo program successful. And those technologies made this country so successful commercially for so long. And I just pray to God we see that kind of commitment to technology development in the future. That's well said. Uh, I, uh, I used to get a lot of questions uh, from uh, people that said, why did we spend so much money on the moon? And my response is, we didn't spend a dime on the moon. We spent it in the United States of America. And we had 400,000 people employed. And it, as Al said, the technologies that we develop, we all enjoy today. Uh, and. You know, thanks to cell phones, Africa never had to string any lines, telephone lines. They all went to the cell phones. And my cell phone has, uh, let's see, 800,000 times a memory of my Apollo computer. Uh, we went to the moon with 80K and uh, five programs in that computer. So uh, it... It's amazing to me what that, how that technology has evolved and how important it is to the economy of well, our country. Just one, one little comment about that, Charlie. We, on Apollo 15, had too many programs for the memory that we had. Uh, 7580K of memory is not a whole lot. All the programs are built into the computer and all we had we had the first interactive computer we had too many programs in our computer that we could not process all of them because we just didn't have the capability so they had to take some of the programs out and the very first one they took out blew my mind because it was a program called return to earth <laughs> well it didn't work anyway, Al. I know, I know, I know, but when they take it out, that's kind of a blow. We, oh, we, well, Charlie. We tried, we tried that program, Return to Earth, uh, in the simulator, and every time we were supposed to have re-entry, we went right by the Earth. And I said, wait a minute, I don't have any confidence in this thing. <laughs> well, Charlie, you know, you, you said you had 80,000, know, 80K uh, in your computer. Uh, and you, that was like seven or eight flights after us. I, I feel fortunate to have flown the first one. And then on our uh, computer, we had uh, 42K, something like that. And uh, 
there's a difference between those days and today because we had to depend on us. Well, we didn't have to make a lunar landing, but we still had to come back. <laughs> not, not, to mention, not to mention the fact that uh, it's a, a totally different uh, world. You're still benefiting from the uh, uh, technology we had in those days. But when we had to, uh, for example, the communication today, you're, the crew is up there, they, they're bothered by the fact that they're interrupted all the time. The ground can talk to them any, just about any minute of it. We used to breathe nicer because the, our maximum, our air to ground communications back in the days of Apollo 7, which was the first mission, was uh, four and a half percent of that entire uh, mission, we had air to ground communications. And when we would get out of, out of it, like maybe past the U.S. or past some island or past some ship on it, boy, we breathed a sigh of relief because we could then do what we needed to do on board. Wow, 42K. I think this microphone has 42K in it. <laughs> probably more. <It's> probably <laughs> they, they didn't need more than that. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's how good we were. <laughs> Okay, so since we're talking about technology, so now there's an increasing number of countries investing in science, in space technology. We're about to take another big journey, so there's going to be another big sort of renaissance. What do you guys see as, as the next wave of technologies? Well, it's hard to predict uh, the future of technologies, but I can tell you this, the whole approach to what to do on space today is... It's modified and changed. You talk to anybody that 40 years ago or 50 years ago was working in space, you'll find that they don't have as optimistic a view, except maybe my friend here, uh, on the technology today. But what's happened is the technology uh, was developed, the uh, bureaucracy also developed, and you've got more and more people at different levels. In fact, a lot of that bureaucracy development was to keep the astronauts from running the program like we used to do in those days. And, and so now everybody's kind of along for the ride. And I'm, it's very good to be doing those kind of things if you're gonna be pushing technology. But a lot of it is now decided more by emotional evolvements, uh, uh, emotional supports. And, and I think that we need to find some way to stick your neck out and, and take some more risks to move ahead on things. Um, one practical application that I know of, uh, silicon chips, when they were first developed, uh, had a measurable dimensions. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to be involved in programs that went deeper than that. And we made things called microelectromechanical devices. And we could build a silicon chip that was no bigger than the diameter of the human hair. And this is the direction that electronics are going. We're going to get to the point where we're not going to be using silicon uh, to uh, manage our electrical systems. We're going to be using molecules, molecular devices, what we do today in silicon chips. I think that's going to be a big thing. I absolutely believe that's why we beat the Russians is because we had solid state devices that helped us get to the moon and back. And I have been to Star City, and I know these guys have, and I've looked into some of their space station stuff, and you could pull a drawer out, and it was all vacuum tubes. You've probably seen them. Uh, lots and lots of vacuum tubes. And we had solid state, and I think that was a big, big thing for us. However, I will say there's one technology that may take a long, long time to develop, but that's propulsion. I think the one weakness in the space program today is propulsion. We have chemical rockets. We have all kinds of other rockets that we're working on now. But my opinion is that until we develop a propulsion system that will put us out there faster than the speed of light, we are just going around the bush. We're not going to get where we want to go because the whole idea of the space program is someday we're gonna to have to go somewhere else. And we can't go there unless we can go 
uh, warp five, okay? Where I'll use a Star Trek uh, analogy uh, because I happen to believe it, that we're gonna have to develop the capability to go faster than the speed of light. We thought the same thing 100 years ago about the speed of sound, that there was a barrier. And we found out, sure enough, we could go faster than that. And I happen to believe that a, a big technology that's gonna have to be developed to get us where we want to go eventually is going to be in our propulsion system. Uh, I sort of agree, uh, well, I do agree with Walt. Uh, it's hard to predict what's going to happen in the future. I mean, uh, the ability of people to innovate, uh, to think and imagine uh, things that uh, are, to me, hard to believe will be happening. I look at an example of, my dad was born in 1907, like three or four years after the Wright brothers. And he watched the development of aviation. He was 65 when I went to the moon. And uh, he could hardly believe it, that, that I was uh, a, a moonwalker. My youngest boy was five. He didn't think it was any big deal. <laughs> we had the whole neighborhood going to the moon. Uh, literally, you know, our next door neighbor was Bill Anders. Neil Armstrong lived a block behind us. Tom Stafford, Frank Borman, uh, uh, Stu Rusa, uh, John Young. We all lived in the same neighborhood. You, the dad was an astronaut or, you, or you're somebody in your family worked for NASA. And so to see all of this development, it's hard to predict, you know, what you, you look out. And I just don't want to, want to predict, but I'll tell you what, it's going to amaze all of us what happens in the future because of the ability that we can use to build on the knowledge we have, Tori. Yeah. One of the things that uh, gets to me about it is the character and the physical, physical characteristics and all that is changing. Our world pretty much the world in, in general, has changed its standards for what does this. The people that are flying today, even on American spacecraft, they're along for the ride. Now there's capabilities developed you know, on, for emergencies and in the background, but it isn't as expected to do that. It's like the competition they've talked about between us and the Russians. The Russians, that, they're the only ones that are really carrying out a, a local program now. We have to fly with them. But from the time the Russians were started, the man was along for the ride, or the lady was along for the ride, whatever it was. The Russians had a different mental attitude, not just a technical one, different mental attitude about how humans should be integrated or not. I personally feel like we've been changing our standards and that we are drifting away from what we used to do, which was try to uh, find people that are willing to stick their necks out to move things forward. And I think that we have to, regardless of how much we do improve on the technology, which I, we need to do, I hope we still have that attitude. I, th I, think, I think there's a lot of technology that's in play today that we do not really know a lot about but it's going to be absolutely unbelievably helpful in the future to get things done. And I'm, and I'm kind of thinking about one thing which is called 3D printing. That was something that we didn't know about 15 years ago. And today we could build almost anything in a 3D printer uh, that we couldn't do before. And, and, and I know Blue Origin is an example, is using 3D printer uh, for almost everything. They're building their engines uh, with 3D printing. And, it, and, and it's, uh, what do I want to say? It's, it's so much more precise and so much easier and quicker than, than, than traditional machining that I think we're into a whole new era of how we build things. And I think there are other things attached to that kind of technology that we're going to benefit from in the future. And a lot of them we don't even know about yet. I, I happen to be, I happen to spend a lot of time working with, with with uh, MEMS devices. And so I know quite a bit about that. But I'll tell you another thing, another, another project that I was uh, involved with, we could build a plastic 
that could withstand 800 degrees. Unbelievable plastic. And we were developing that plastic to go on the wing of a supersonic transport if we ever built one, back when the boys could build that. But there are plastics, believe it or not, there are plastics out there that can go up to 800 degrees. This is the kind of technology we need in the future. Oh, and I totally agree. Yeah, we, uh, you know, my, my son, who's a college student, has a 3D printer in his dorm room. He uses it every day. And we have just barely started on that technology. When we begin designing with that technology in mind as our baseline, that's when we'll begin to see changes. And, and Char, that must have been a hell of a neighborhood for your son to grow up in, but I'm not sure it was the statistically valid sampling of America at the time. <laughs> All right, so we should have some, some time for questions from the audience, if you guys are okay with that. All right, who's got one? Who's got a question? You know everything? There's, uh, there's, there's water underneath all your chairs if you need any water. Just you raise your hand. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Do you hear me? Yeah? Uh, my name... I would like to know what is our next priority? What is our next priority going to space? <coughs> our next priority for going to space. I guess I can't say that I know the perfect answer because it depends a lot on what, what is developing in our attitude. But we need to keep improving the, technolo the technologies and the velocity of which you, what you're moving in space is a tremendously significant one. Uh, they talk about, well, we got Elon Musk is going to take, I think, 1,000 or 10,000 people to land on Mars in 2024. Uh, the public at large doesn't challenge ridiculous statements like that. And you've got to get to that because we are going to be able to, we're going to have to start being able to go faster to get these places. And there are problems associated with it that the public at large isn't aware of. The difference in the change in, in gravity or whether you're attracted by a, 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 the moon or a, another planet out there. Not to mention the fact we also are, don't have a lot of thought today about the uh, uh, thinking about why we should do this or why should we, we not do it. We gotta find good reasons to do it and then you better start thinking about how to do it successfully and not just waste your time. Um. My response to that is that I think what we need to do in space is make it so cheap that anybody can go. Uh, I think uh, we're not going to get the broad support for space. We're not going to be able to do the things we need to do unless we make space accessible uh, to lots and lots more people. There are not too many people who can afford to spend $80 million to go to the space station. Okay. We need to get that down. And there are technologies out there that will allow us to do that sooner or later. Uh, uh, there's an engine being developed in England uh, called the uh, reaction engine uh, that can go from the runway uh, to supersonic, scramjet, it turns into a scramjet, it go up hypersonic, it turns into a rocket, and it goes into orbit. So you can get on one airplane, go from a runway to orbit, in, at, in, at one time. I think this is probably the key, if we could do something like that, that's gonna be a key to getting the support of the broad base of people that will keep the space program going. Um, but I also believe that our goal in space is not Mars. It's not Moon, it's not Mars. It's way, way beyond that. It's somewhere else in another galaxy somewhere uh, where we can find a planet that we can live on. and that's, that, to me, is the goal of the space program. So we've talked about propulsion a couple of times. How do we feel about nuclear propulsion for interplanetary trips? Well, I think uh, nuclear, uh, the whole nuclear power, not just nuclear propulsion, is going to be an increasing bit of answers to a lot of things that we need. And right now, what have you got? You had the social 
group changed the mental attitude about uh, nuclear power, the use of nuclear facilities, and what happens like that. Eventually, I'm uh, like my friend here, is that things are going to move along. Uh, nuclear power is just one step to finding some other technological ways of doing this. But I think it's a st relatively stupid trip to try to go, for example, take men out to uh, the planet Mars with today's technology, which could work to get you there, and you might even be stupid enough to land on the planet. Uh, and they'd probably find some reason why today's technology wasn't going to get you back. But you've got to be willing to stick your necks out on what's coming up. But don't think that what you know today everything is, is going to answer all of the things that you need to do to do that. The key thing is the mental attitude. Our society has got to get away from what it has been doing on saying that everybody is equal, everybody is equally capable, and you don't f focus on it. I think we've got to get to the point where we're looking at the best you can in all kinds of technologies. Uh, I want to I, I make a comment about that, Walt. Um, and it's off the subject a little bit. Uh, but the one thing we haven't talked about is people. We've talked about technology, we've talked about plans, we've talked about all kinds of things. But we haven't really talked about people. And I got to say that I've been asked a thousand times, what kind of a crew are we going to send to Mars? And my answer is always, send me. Well, that's a very logical thing. Uh, okay, I'm 87 years old, right? What the hell do I have to lose going to Mars, right? I think, it, I think that's a given. I, I, I think that, and, and besides, at my age, I'm very comfortable just sitting watching TV all day. So, so I would be okay going to Mars and coming back. Uh, uh, younger people, I think there, there are some problems that have NASA's uh, still looking at, and I think they're going to have to solve before they send a young crew, especially if it's a mixed crew. Uh, so, but I think, you know, in addition to the technology, I think, I think the human side of spaceflight needs to be looked at a lot more carefully than it is. Okay, can I go with you? Yes. Can I go with you? That's a. <laughs> oh no, Mrs. Bruno said no, but that's a that's a I, good that's a good attitude for you to go, and you, I I'll think. Send you. And I think, you know, well, you're older than me by at least a month. But uh, your attitude, you see, is good to go out there. Unfortunately, I don't know what we're going to do when you die before we even get you escaping from the Earth's gravitational field. We never make it. The people that paid the bill. <laughs> we get there, that's all they want. <laughs> all, right. all right, another question over here. Gentleman with a distinguished beard. What do you all think of the current NASA, current NASA plans for back to the moon in five years, 30 billion, and have the first woman on the moon by then? It's ridiculous. I don't think it's ridiculous. I don't think we're going to make it because I'm not sure that we've got the financing for it. But uh, at least we got a vision, and that's better than no vision at all. And the vision is to return to the moon, and, I th and I've been pushing for that for years. And uh, establish a moon base, and uh, whether we get there in five years or not, we at least have a, a road map, so let's go back and uh, build the station. And, uh, and there's some great reasons for that. Uh, whether we can... We built the lunar module in five years, basically, and we can start now if we get the funding. I, think that, I don't think it's a matter of anything but the money right now. And whether we can get the funding, uh, if with the right kind of funding, we're going to be able to do it. There's a lot of great things going on in space. Uh, ULA is launching these rockets. We got uh, commercialization. We got uh, NASA looking at deep space. Uh, with uh, uh, Artemis, which includes uh, 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 the uh, Orion. Uh, I mean, it'll go there, but no lander. So we, 
need to get a lander. If we're going to do that, we got to develop a lander, is in my in my opinion. So uh, uh, I don't think I'll get to go there again, but I would uh, uh, I certainly support the crews that are going to be going, and uh, and be, be a great uh, opportunity for our country. I I think you have to have a goal. I think no matter what you do in life, you need a goal. And you need an achievable goal, and you need, and you need a way to, to, to do that goal. You know, there's an old axiom that if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't make any difference how you get there. And I think that's kind of where we are with NASA today. We do have the goal, and they do have a clear path to getting there. And I think that's the only way you go to it. And it may not work, because NASA can set all the goals in the world, but unless Congress does something to support that, we're not going anywhere. So I think we're very dependent on Washington to see that the resources are available to NASA uh, so that NASA can achieve their goal. There's some good points there, but there's also the other thing that's going on. Everything costs more today than it cost and we're making improvements to cut down those costs. But for example, the Apollo program, the Apollo program, the entire one, was $20 billion, went over. If the whole program was run, it came to $25 billion. If you convert that to today's uh, economy, that's like $150 billion today. And we're getting more efficient. And you take a look at, uh, what we knew about the moon when we went out there and landed, almost nothing compared to today. We know so much more about Mars today than we ever even came close to knowing about the moon in those days. So, so we can continue to, to develop it. But there will come a time when our uh, attitude will cause us to want to go there anyway. And that's, a, that's an important thing that's happening. But we better develop the kind of technology to do it and not ignore it. And uh, I think that'll happen one of these days. I always like to say, just because you don't know where you're going doesn't mean you ought to be late. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Get there on time. <laughs> All right, we got time for one more question. I see someone there who's very important to this community, Supreme Overlord of Space herself. Kim Wells, what do you got? I give up. <laughs> so I have a question for you. you. We've talked about how all of you inspired us in our generation. Clearly, you can see we did that. But how do we inspire the next generation? So many of us have kids, little ones. We're trying to figure out how do we get them excited for space and get them involved in this program? Well, uh, I think that we have the uh, present generation is uh, pretty enthusiastic. Uh, when Al and I applied, we had 3,500 all males to apply. NASA selected, I think, in 2017, uh, a, 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 the next class astronaut. They had 18,000 applications. And, uh, and so there was no shortage of applications. And out of that 18,000, they picked 12, if I'm correct. So it's... Uh, the interest is out there. The younger generations are ready to go. Uh, and if we can establish a program and keep going uh, with it, whether it be private astronauts or NASA astronauts or whatever, uh, there's, there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of young people want to go. And I just encourage everybody that I speak to, my grandkids, study something you like. Because if, if you study physics and you hate physics, and they cancel the space program because you got, you're supposed to be a physics major, then you're, you're, you're done. So pick something you like and study it with all you can. And whether you get to space or not, you're going to have a successful, uh, uh, challenging career. The other thing, though, I suggestion, I may be off unique on some of these standings, but I need, think you need to get back to getting the best you can recognize that the answers to questions are not all equal. Two people are not equal in anything, whatever it is. And you've got to quit t telling the public at large that everybody 
is equal and everybody has the same chance. You've got to start finding somebody that does have the chance that will do that. And uh, I hope we can, can get to that. Then we, we'll operate the best we can. We've got to get to that kind of an attitude. So I'm going to pile on to this answer. My wife and I are both engineers. We both worked in rockets. I have produced, we have produced a son and a daughter who are both rocket scientists as well. And it was a simple matter of brainwashing from birth. <laughs> well, I, I will say this. I, I believe one of the greatest challenges that we have in this country today is the education of our young, of our young people. We graduate something like 10% of the number of, John, you could probably correct this, but 10% of the number of engineers that China graduates. I don't know the exact number, but I know it's, it's a multiple of what, we, well, of what we graduate every year. We gotta do better than that. And I know there are lots and lots of programs out there um, uh, that are now focusing on trying to promote science, technology, engineering, and math. And I do that myself. I do that with Coleman. We do that everywhere we go. We go to schools and we talk to the kids. And I think it's extremely important that more and more people promote the value of science, technology, engineering, and math to the young people. And I'm not talking about high school and college. I'm talking about middle school because by the time they get to college, they've already decided what they're going to do. I think that's one of the major things as a country if we really want to exceed in doing what we're gonna do in space, that we've gotta focus on getting these young people along uh, in our STEM courses. That's great, great advice. We need more STEM, more engineers. All right, I'm told we're having a toast. Are we having a toast? We're having a toast. Oh, look at this. Wow. Thank you. Are these all equal? Are these all equal? They are now. Well, yours is, but yours is better, Walt. All right, I'm going to offer the first toast. To the brave men who opened the final frontier into the future you have inspired. Cheers. Charlie. Would you like to offer a toast, Al? I'd say I'd like to offer a toast to all the people who made it possible for us to do what we did. All of you folks. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, bottoms up. Thank you folks. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you all. Coming.